to the DevNet uh, Create Theater, our last session of the day. We have our wonderful director of uh, developer experience, Mandy Whaley, to come talk to us. Looking forward to this one. Well, welcome, Mandy. Thanks, Paul. How's it going? All right. Thank you. Thanks for making it to this end of day session. And um, I at the end of the day today, I wanted to do a talk that's a little bit different than uh, the talks that I normally do. Uh, and a lot different than some of the talks you've probably heard throughout the day. So this talk is uh, a wide-ranging set of things around Marie Curie uh, and it's some parallels with open source, Kickstarter, and women in tech. So I hope you enjoy it, and I'd love to have thoughts, feedback, anything you have after, after the talk. So this whole kind of exploration started with a present from my dad. And um, he knows that Marie Curie is kind of a, a childhood hero of mine. And he gave me this book called Making Marie Curie. Uh, and it's about the intellectual property and her sort of celebrity and how that developed during the historical time period that she lived in. And so I thought that I would go backwards. All right. So what I thought is this will be a nice read. It's a good birthday present from my dad. Um, I'm really interested in intellectual property law. And so this will kind of tickle my fancy there. And I'll get some new interesting facts about my third grade hero. What I did not expect is that there would be all of these fascinating parallels between her work in the early 1900s and the technology space that we work in today. And so what I want to do is share some of those parallels with you and kind of how they relate to a lot of the things we have going on in our industry. So first, the Marie Curie refresher. This is uh, her career in, in a couple quick bullet points, because you've probably heard of her, but you may not remember back to your science class all the things that she did. First, I want to start with this quote. Life is not easy for any of us, but what of that? We must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that this thing must be attained. And I loved this quote when I was growing up, and it stayed with me. And I think it sets a backdrop for all of the things that are in this talk. So first. Uh, these are some of the things that Marie Curie did during her career. She coined the term radioactive. She was part of one of the most uh, successful and influential husband and wife's teams in science. She discovered two new elements, radium and polonium. She was the first female professor ever at the Sorbonne. She was also the first woman ever to be awarded the Nobel Prize. And she's still the only woman to have won in multiple disciplines, to have won the Nobel Prize in multiple disciplines. So some pretty amazing accomplishments. And she did this in a time when a lot of women weren't doing these kinds of things. And that presented some interesting challenges. So this is the periodic chart uh, around 1898. So you've probably seen our modern day periodic chart. But this is what it looked like in 1898 before Marie Curie did her work. And you can see there's these blank spots where they knew elements had to exist, but they hadn't been able to prove their existence yet. This is our periodic chart today. And these ones outlined in green, radium and polonium, are the two elements that Marie Curie actually found and proved the existence of. And this was very important for me when I was growing up because you know, I had the periodic chart hanging on my bedroom wall. And it was very tangible to me that Marie Curie had discovered these two elements that were on this really important piece of scientific work. And it just was a very real and understandable um, thing to latch on to. And I think that's why she ended up being such an important sort of influence for me. Then now in my career as a working mom and working in tech, I have learned some different things about her life and it puts a different lens on it. And that is sort of the overlay of her personal life and her professional career. And I think this quote is really interesting because she says, I've frequently been questioned, especially by women, of how I could reconcile family life with a scientific career. Well, it has not been easy. And I think everyone could relate to that. It's, it's definitely not easy. But in her case, you know, she, she had a very interesting um, success in doing that. And to put some context around that, this is a timeline of sort of her early career and then later when she, when she moves into being an actual successful celebrity. And there's a couple of things that are, make this an interesting back, backdrop for some of the stories that I'm going to tell. And one is the overall relatively short timeline that happens during the early career. You can see where she begins studying 
She gets her master's degree. She marries her partner, Pierre, and then has her first daughter, and then discovers the two elements, all in a very compressed amount of time. And then very soon after that, in the same year, wins the Nobel Prize and earns her doctorate. So, I mean, that, that's kind of mind-boggling to, to think about that. And that year was 1903, so having all of that happen in 1903 for a woman in France. Then she moves into a, a more known and sort of celebrity phase of her career, where she wins her second Nobel Prize, opens the Radium Institute, and, um, and, and, and starts doing some things across in, internationally. All right, so the first parallel that I want to talk about is called, uh, is what I call open sourcing radium. And this basically comes down to a publish or patent debate and quandary that Marie Curie found herself in. So when the Curies began their work, they got really interested in strong radiation from different minerals that they knew contained uranium. But they did some really precise measurements and they figured out that this one, um, uranium ore called pitchblende, emitted way more radiation than they could account for with the known elements that they actually understood. So they, they knew, they theorized that there had to be another unknown radioactive element, but they couldn't discover, they couldn't actually prove its existence as of yet. Um, they did discover these two new elements, polonium and radium. Radium does not exist in nature by itself. Um, and it's, they knew that they had to create an isolated sample of just that element to prove its existence. So Marie spent much time, much hard work, working to refine the pitch blend and actually isolate one-tenth of a gram of radium to prove its existence. So uh, just to back up, my original first career was in chemical engineering. So this actually brings together a couple of my, my, my loves together in, in this story. Now what was interesting about this is the actual element, that's a piece of nature that exists out in nature. But this refining it and isolating the radium, that was the secret sauce. They, she had to define that process and figure out how it actually worked and how to do that. And this is where the publish or patent dilemma comes in. So on one hand, they had discovery of new elements. That is pure science, not something that you would patent. On the other hand, they had a process to refine new elements. And this is actually an invention. There was a lot of precedent for patenting chemical processes. This was new knowledge that you could patent and potentially make money off of, have commercial interests, all kinds of things like that. But there was a catch. In the early 1900s in France, married women did not have the right to own property. And this extended to intellectual property. So the law was actually that married women were grouped with children and the insane as incapables, and they could not sign contracts or hold property, so they obviously could not apply for a patent or hold that contract. So publish your patent. How many people here have been involved in a, in a patent, pursuit of a patent or getting one, right? Can you imagine doing that and having your research partner who contributed to it and saying, you can't be a part of that patent, patent process. Your name can't be on the patent. So this left the Curies with a really interesting quandary because they were a partnership. They both worked on the laboratory and actually the process to refine the radium was mostly Marie's work when you looked at their laboratory notebooks. So they came up with something to me that reminds me a lot of, open day, of modern day open source. So they published the knowledge and the details of how to do the refining process. But they patented the tools and the measuring devices and things that you needed to actually do the, to do the process. And then they sold consulting services on using the process. And they opened the Radium Institute. So this, to me, looks a lot like open sourcing something, having a hosted enterprise subscription, selling the tools that you want, and then having a thriving community around it. And they actually did a great job of using this model to further the research of radium, to get industries started around it, and then to have the Radium Institute where a ton of interesting research happened. So to me, maybe this is like the first time this model was actually put together with all the pieces of open sourcing it, the enterprise tools around it, and, and, and having that consulting services put together. 
And that, really, that just really stood out to me when I was reading this book. The other part was the public contributions. So publishing uh, gave Marie a way to really document and show her concrete contributions to the science. And she was a relentless note taker, published her notebooks, published notes on everything. And to me, this is an analogy to what we can do today in open source code, where if you're doing commits in GitHub, you are building your public track record. You are relentlessly building this track record of success. And I think this is important if you are someone who is struggling with you know, finding the confidence to go after a certain career path, having that track record, building that open source um, sort of public persona in the open source community can really help you out. And these are Marie Curie's actual notebooks. These are, you can view them online. They're actually digitizing them so that everyone can see them. And they have to be online because they are still radioactive. So they actually have to be still locked in lead boxes because they're still emitted, emitting radioactivity. So the other part that's interesting during this publish phase and when they're getting started on all of this is that during this phase, the Curies wrote three notes to the Academy of Sciences. So the Academy of Sciences in France at this time was like the ruling body over all things scientific. And it was the place that you got your work recognized. And it's interesting to look at how Marie named herself in the author list on those papers. So the first note that they wrote, she's the single author, and she signs her full name with her Polish uh, maiden name as well. On the second note, she follows her husband, and, on the, and she takes out her maiden name and just has S. And then on the third note, she's the second author between two men, and now she's just Madame P. Curie. So her name isn't really even actually there anymore. And when you trace this through as the author does in the book, it's really interesting because you see that Pierre's identity remained stable throughout this whole process. But as their discoveries became more and more important and went more and more towards proving the existence of this element, that Marie's name shifted more because it became more important to attach the discovery to someone who had the right to own intellectual property, to someone that had personhood under the law. And this is, this is interesting, and um, I just think it, it, it's a, it is an interesting thing to think about when we hear stories about you know, uh, women who start signing emails with a, a male name and get a different response and some of these things that we see in the industry, right? It, it has a certain resonance with that. Okay, so the next part goes into their career, and this is the part that has some resonance with today's diversity and inclusion um, discussions. And this goes through a very tumultuous time in her life, but there's a lot of interesting pieces to it. So in 1904, this is Marie Curie and her husband Pierre Curie on the cover of Vanity Fair. They were by this time complete international celebrities. Everyone was, imagination was taken with the idea of radioactivity. You can see Pierre holding up that glowing test tube. And everyone had all these high hopes of what radioactive elements could be used for. So it's, not, it's interesting, but they were a scientific team who became an actual celebrity. But then in 1906, tragedy stuck, struck. And Pierre was actually hit by a carriage and, and passed away. And so this was a huge change for the dynamic of their work. And we see this echo through the, the next years of Marie's career. So this caused a lot of disruption. The work that was going on with radioactivity in France at that time was considered to be like a national importance. They um, felt that it was important for staying moving their economy forward, you know, keeping security, things like that. And so they did nominate Marie to succeed her husband at the Sorbonne to continue this work. And so she becomes the first female professor at the Sorbonne ever. And, th and this was a very big deal. And now, as a widow, things change where Marie can now own property. And she can own things under the law. So this starts to change some of the dynamic as well. And we see her at this time kind of coming out from the shadows. The work is continuing, but Pierre cannot be the lead author on the articles anymore. It's only Marie. Uh, she can sign contracts, she can own property, she can be a professor, she can manage all the laboratory connections. It becomes harder for the establishment to kind of ignore that she was doing a large part of the work. And so she becomes more controversial, and it becomes harder for her to do some things. 
And all of this happened against a background in 1911 of sort of a rising tide of traditionalism. And she was seen as being very modern, as being um, you know, a Polish young mother. She had just defended her thesis and just become the first ever woman professor. And so there was, there was some controversy around that traditionalism versus her being viewed as a, you know, a proponent of modernism at the time. Oops, wrong way. <clears throat> so then something very significant happens. The Academy of Sciences has a seat open up. And Pierre had won a seat in 1905. And in 1910, a seat opened up and Marie was a candidate. And in the book, it says Marie seemed like a shoe-in, which I thought it, just the word shoe-in looked hilarious written, and so I wanted to write it down on my slide. Um, so she seems like a shoe-in. People think she's a leading scientist, but wait, she would be the first female candidate ever to be on the Academy of Sciences. And so this causes quite an uproar. <clears throat> she adamantly um, stressed that she wanted it to be about the science. She didn't want this to be about her. She has this great quote about she doesn't want the custom changed in any way to accommodate her. But sadly, that's not what happened. This is a picture of Marie hiding behind her purse to get away from the paparazzi. Um, she's the one here with the, the purse in front of her face. And this is backed up by her quote of, in science, we must be interested in things, not persons. She was trying to take it away from, from her persona and keep it focused on the science. And then this whole debate in France erupted around it, and it became a politically charged and a culturally charged issue where this debate over allowing female candidates for the Academy of Science. And they had two candidates. On one side, they had Edward, Edward Branley, who was the inventor of wireless telegraphy, telegraphy um, versus Marie Curie. And she was seen as modernism, he was seen as safe and traditional, and they were even saying, you know, that voting for Marie Curie was voting against universal values and tradition. And this is the way it was framed in newspaper articles, in lectures at the time. And so there was a big um, choice that the Academy had to make at this time. And they chose no. They did not. They elected Branley to the seat. Um, and there was a lot of disappointment, and people thought, will, will she try again? She, does, she declined. She decided not to try again. And how long do you think it was until we had a first female member of the Academy elected? Anyone guess? 10 years? 15? 68. 68 years. It took until 1979 to have the first female elected to the Academy of Sciences. And then things just got weird. <laughs> there was a, definitely a period where um, some love letters were stolen, they were published, there was an alleged affair. Marie had five duels fought over her honor. And this is actual footage of one of the duels that's on YouTube, you can look up. So there, there were three pistol duels and two sword duels, and this is actual footage of one of the duels. And during all of this turmoil with the duels and the, the, the newspaper articles and, and the celebrity around it, this is when she won her second Nobel Prize that was to her alone, without Pierre. And to, just to imagine that today, that backdrop of that happening and then winning, being the first woman ever and still the only woman to win a Nobel Prize in two disciplines is really interesting. So the next parallel that I want to talk about is what I call Marie Curie's Kickstarter campaign. So this is um, a picture of radium. And in 1921, how much do you think a, radi a gram of radium cost? Any guesses? Five dollars. Yeah. It cost $100,000 for one gram. It was the most valuable material on Earth at that time. And that was, this was because it was so hard to refine and because they felt like there was such opportunity around this new substance that no one understood. And around this time, Marie Curie met this New York socialite. And she started talking to her, and this New York socialite, Miss, Missy Brown M Maloney, was a huge fan of Marie Curie. And she started talking to her, and she said, well, you know, you must have tons of radium to do your own research on, right? You're the head of the Radium Institute. You discovered this. She said, how many grams of radium do you have? And Marie said, none, I have zero. I don't have any that's for my own personal research. And 
the, this New York socialite was blown away by this, and she wanted to take some action to help fix this. And so what she did was she started a subscription fund to buy Marie Curie a gram of radium. And she initially started this, she thought, oh, you know, I'm a, I have many wealthy friends, I'll go to like 10 of them and, and get the money and, and we'll give it to her and this will be a cool thing. But what actually happened when she opened this up was they actually did it where anyone could walk into a bank and sign up and donate whatever amount they wanted. So they had people donating $1,000, they had people donating $1. They had people running bake sales around the country to actually donate money to this fund to buy Marie Curie her own gram of radium. And it became this amazing sort of outcry of support of the women of America coming together to buy this for, for Marie. And so it's really an interesting parallel today to sort of, you know, Kickstarters and GoFundMes and all of these crowdsourcing ways to move something forward. And in that year, they raised way more than the $100,000. They actually scraped together three times the amount that Einstein won for the Nobel Prize that year. And today, I think in terms that would come out to be like two, $2 million or something crazy like that. So it like was a really significant amount of money and they did buy the, the gram of radium and then they also put the rest of it into um, a fund for her laboratory that funded a lot of her research going forward. Okay. So, but why talk about all this history? This is like a lot of history. Um, we're at a tech conference. I mean, we are in the Computer History Museum, but still, why so much history? And one of the things when I, when I read this book and what really stood out to me was, what if you take some of our current events and just switch out the name? Something that seems controversial today, what if you're like, this well-known figure like Marie Curie was in that situation? Does it sound ridiculous? Does it sound fair? How, how do we compare? So I think that's a useful context to think about. And then the other reason that I want to talk about is just the power of heroes. So who saw the Wonder Woman movie? Yeah, pretty amazing, right? Um, when it came out, I went to go see it. I was really busy during that time, and I didn't think a lot about it. But I wanted to go take my niece to go see it. And we went to go see it, and I was watching it. And it, you know, it really hit me much harder than I expected it to. And that could have been one reason, because my niece was sitting beside me going, I cannot believe this, like the whole movie, which was amazing. Um, but I came out of it, and I was talking to my husband, and I said, you know, wow, that really had more of an impact on me than I, than I thought. Um, it was really interesting. And he was like, really? He goes, but what about your name tag? And I was like, my name tag? And he was like, yeah, your name tag. And I was like, oh, yeah, my name tag. And he reminded me of this name tag that my, that my mom mailed to me. Um, when I was a kid, I lived in a small Texas town and thought label makers were a really fun toy. So I made this name tag, and it says Wonder Woman, Mandy White, Queen of Hawaii on it, uh, which apparently um, I, I had been to Hawaii. I thought it was cool, but I think that Wonder Woman was, was the top category. And my mom had framed it and sent it to me, and she sent it to me at a time when I was, had had my first kid and was returning back to work and was trying to figure out, like, how do I have a career, and how do I be a mom, and how do I fit all this together in my head, and I couldn't really figure it out. And she said, you know, look at all these things you thought you could be at the same time when you were five. I think you can figure this out. And so he was pointing out, like, yes, you had this hero. You may have forgotten about it. That's why this movie hit you so hard. And that got me thinking about my career and choices that I had made. And I think back on it to teenage Mandy, and I had a lot of interest. Math was absolutely one of my biggest interests. And I think about who kind of represented mathematicians to me at that time. And, and you know, these are a couple of them. I also really liked archaeology uh, randomly. And this was kind of, you know, media figures or pretend figures, but also famous archaeologists that represented that to me at that time. And then I also liked chemistry. And Marie Curie represented that to me at that time. And then my grandmother was in the Navy. So she constantly told me about Grace Hopper. And then I also had read The Cuckoo's Egg by Clifford Stoll. Who's read that book, by the way? If you haven't read it, you've got to read this book. It's, it's amazing. And so you know, these were kind of different things I had in my mind as icons, careers that seem interesting as a teenager. And when I think about what I did, I did chemistry and computers. I did chemical engineering and computer engineering. And it's hard to parse out now, but I think what I said then 
was that those seemed more realistic to me. And maybe that's because there were actually some role models I had in, in my mind that, that were you know, more like me than some of the other ones. So just some things to think about there in terms of how this story of Marie Curie can resonate with today and how it's important to have some of those, those heroes to compare against. I definitely recommend this book. It's called Making Marie Curie, Intellectual Property and Celebrity Culture in an Age of Information. It's a fantastic book. Uh, definitely check it out. It's on Amazon. You can find it. And I'd love to know your comments or any thoughts that you have about it. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Mandy. Um, next, we'll have uh, Susie coming in. And I guess Mandy will be joining her, too, with uh, the wrap-up of the day. That'll be starting at 6, I yep. think. Yep, at 6. Cool. Because we've got workshops finishing up right now. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you guys.